Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Survit Survi yes. Survi to, uh, to Dias. Uh, you are looking from Hy Hyderabad, and uh, I believe you were a postdoc in Brussels before some, before this. And uh, anyway, I'm not great with these introductions. It's far more things. Are, at least tell us about quantum chaos and operator roles in the CFT. Thank you, Danger, and uh, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, so I will tell about uh, quantum chaos uh, and its relation to operator growth in certain two-dimensional conformal field theories. Uh, and uh, this talk will be based majorly on these two papers, on these two works. The first one was in collaboration with the group at uh, Bridge University, uh, Brussels in Belgium. And uh, uh, the second paper is a more recent work. So, uh, let me give a brief introduction about classical chaos. Uh, so, uh, chaos is a ubiquitous phenomena in many body quantum systems. And uh, it states that uh, points in phase space which start infinitesimally close to one another, they end up following entirely different trajectories. Uh, so, some examples of chaos is uh, the weather. So. The forecast says that it will rain in the afternoon, but till one, even one or two hours before, we don't know the exact time of rain. That's because of chaos, nonlinearities. And uh, even a, simple, uh, a system as simple as the double pendulum exhibits uh, chaos. So uh, what is chaos? Uh, basically, uh, in a classical uh, sense, it states that, uh, that in a system, uh, if uh, two trajectories, they start their journey, very close to one another, uh, they will, uh, in the chaotic system, they will end up so far apart that it cannot be uh, determined by uh, the usual laws of uh, classical mechanics where they end up. Uh, and they end up exponentially far from each other. Uh, and uh, so here in the diagram, it is show, uh, depicted that uh, the points at some time t are exponentially far from each other. And uh, the exponent there, lambda, is the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, so just to quantify this a uh, little bit better, uh, in classical Hamiltonian dynamics on phase space, uh, chaos is characterized by looking at the distance between two trajectories at a certain time t divided by the distance between them at initial time. Uh, and that is given by the Poisson bracket of uh, uh, position and momenta. And that grows exponentially in time. And the exponent lambda there is the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, now, in this talk, we will focus on quantum chaos. So we will transition into a definition of uh, chaos in a quantum system using this Poisson bracket. So in the quantum case, uh, where the dynamics is governed by a Hamiltonian, uh, we promote this Poisson bracket of uh, position and momentum to a commutator with appropriate factors of i h bar. And uh, now we want a number, so we want to take the expectation value of this quantity. However, uh, this quantity in itself, it fluctuates around zero. Uh, in order to avoid that, we take the square of the quantity. So that is uh, the second line there. Uh, and this gives us uh, one way to characterize chaos in a quantum system. So we take the expectation value of the commutator squared. And this grows exponentially uh, with the exponent lambda here again. Now what this quantity contains, uh, so this exponential behavior in this quantity is entirely contained in this correlator which is out of time ordered. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, this correlator is out of time ordered. Uh, uh, I have depicted it in this diagram here. So uh, one of the operators P is inserted at time zero. Then we go up in time and insert the operator X. Then we go back in time and insert the operator P again uh, at time zero. And then again, we go up in time and insert the operator X. So that is uh, this, uh, out of time ordered correlator, and that contains the entire exponential growth. What about if you change the sign of t? 
uh, okay, uh, let's say that uh, we are considering positive time. It's, I think it will be convention. We can either be considering zero to t or just negative times, one half of the mm -hmm. real line. The things which are diverging will converge if you change the sign. Uh, ah, okay, yes, here. So, yeah, the convention is that uh, you keep time to be positive. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this method of uh, transitioning from classical chaos to uh, quantum chaos, this was already known, uh, uh, this understanding of uh, 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 quantum chaos from this commutator squared and its expectation value was already known in the late 1960s uh, by the work of, of Chinnikov and other authors. Uh, but it was more recently popularized by the work of Kitayev, Madison and Schenker in Stanford in the last decade. Uh, some negative key converge this huge time transition symmetry to like shift the key dependence to p and take x to zero if you got minus key and zero this multiply plus key. I think uh, the uh, the constraint is here like this e to the power two lambda t. I, I think there the, would be a minus t there, right? So the invariant way of writing it would be to write uh, x of t one p of t two one and it's going to dip. dip. It's going to yeah. be uh, T1 minus T2. Yeah, I mean, okay. always in chaotic dynamics discussions, they talk about negative curvature and the geodesics diverge. Do you know anything just diverging as time goes forward? It's converging as time goes backwards. Yeah, no, but it, this is not, this is neither. What she's doing there is she's saying, it, but it's, but it's, it's not actually time that's evolving. It's, the variable. it's the separation in time between P0 and T. Yeah, it's the actual variable in here. Yeah, but still, but do you, you, move you can't move them less. That's a, that's a positive quantity. Yeah. If p zero ex, is precedes, uh, if p zero precedes p precedes square, t, yeah. Yeah, precedes so, x. In I, I classical don't... sense, it's it's a non-reversible dynamics. In the classical sense, like yeah, the weather. Sense, yeah. uh, in, in course, in classical dynamics, it's not that reversible. It's yeah. quite reversible it's in reversible. classical dynamics. I think the statement would be that there would exist another con configuration for which it will converge. No, I mean it's again a, it's again the possible bracket between x and where she has defined the zero is between x and zero. P of zero is a fixed time. I mean the perturbation is given is being given in the past with respect to t. Yes. P zero. There are two times involved in the equation. Yeah. So it's the it's the two times that are that's essential here, if I understand it correctly. Yes, it's the difference between the two. Right. So uh, yes, so let's look more carefully at this out of time ordered correlator. And, uh, and you, just to go back, you yes. said that. Uh, the other terms in the commutator are, are not relevant. Yes, that's correct. Uh, because uh, the other terms, there will be a time ordered piece. Uh, so there will be two time ordered pieces and two out of time ordered pieces. Yes. And it's the exponential growth comes only from the out of time ordered piece. The other one is probably exponential decay. Uh, it's uh, It kind of factorizes. So if you're looking at normalized correlators, then that would give you a one. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it factorizes, so there will the time ordered correlator. Uh, so moving ahead, uh, we will focus on the out of time ordered correlator, and here uh, I have written it uh, in terms of different operators v's and w's. So we will be uh, talking of this in in, more, in terms of more general operators and not in terms of the position or momenta. Uh, that's why I've written it like this. So. Uh, uh, the form of the out of time order correlator, the normalized one, is generally uh, it grows. Uh, so there is an order one term, and then it, uh, there is another term which grows exponentially in time. And all the other uh, dependences, uh, de uh, all the other dependence on the position of the operators, they sit in front of the exponential. So this is generally in the examples which have already been studied. This is how the out of time order turns out to be. And uh, yeah, there's one here because uh, if uh, forgotten the normalization here, but if you were to normalize it with WW and VV correlator, then that would be a one. 
А what? Is f of z. F of z. So it's it's some function which will uh, depend only on the position of the operators. So all the time dependence is in that exponential, but uh, whatever other dependence is there, like on the position, they will be in that function f of z. Uh, so uh, in the works of uh, Kitai, Maldi, Sana, Shankar, Stanford, uh, they proposed uh, this out of time order correlator as a diagnostic of chaos in the quant in quantum systems. Uh, and more specifically, in the work of Maldesena, Shankar, and Stanford, uh, a bound was proposed on the Lyapunov exponent uh, for quantum theory, uh, and this is the bound. Uh, so uh, the Lyapunov exponent cannot grow faster uh, than 2 pi by h cross beta. Beta is inverse temperature, so beta is 1 over temperature. Uh, and uh, basically, this is the Lyapunov exponent, 2 pi by h bar beta is the Lyapunov exponent of Einstein gravity. So the, the statement is that theory is admitting Einstein gravity dual, they saturate this bound, and a quantum theory cannot have a Lyapunov exponent which uh, exceeds uh, the Lyapunov exponent of Einstein gravity. Uh, so that was the... Uh, so, so in a way, it's your expectation values of thermal expectation, that trace on yes. trace with yes. the Yes, indeed. Uh, so in the remaining part of the talk, I will just refer to this as the MSS bound, maybe just to quickly refer to this particular bound. Uh, so at beta is the beta is the one that is the, uh, the is what enters into the Gibbs. Yes. Yes. Um, and, uh, okay. yeah. and there's some theories admitting Einstein gravity. Uh, so theories admitting Einstein gravity do will saturate this bound. So the uh, two pi by h bar beta is the Lyapunov exponent of Einstein gravity. What does that mean? You mean in the black hole background? Or yes, in, uh, uh, yes, or in a thermal background, yes. Uh, in any thermal background, so the sitter is also true. Uh, okay, so I'll say, I'm not mm -hmm. sure about the sitter, but uh, definitely BTZ, uh, the, so uh, black hole, it is short child, it is short child. Mm -hmm. So the temperature is the temperature of the black hole? Oh, well, she didn't say that. She said it was uh, Yes, it is. It is. So the dual field theory, uh, uh, so the temperature is the temperature of the field theory, thermal field theory. And... Okay, so it's on the boundary. Sorry, yes. is, it, is the temperature of the thermal field theory you're talking about, not the, necessarily the... You, uh, I, 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 like I'm, 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 I yes, I'm coming from the perspective of ADS-CFT where uh, the temperature of the thermal field theory uh, is also the temperature of the dual black hole. Okay, I see. Do you know how it comes? Yeah. What gives that kind of a bound? Uh, so, uh, I, I, there is a kind of a derivation of the bound uh, later on in the talk. Uh, so basically it depends on uh, very basic uh, things such as the uh, analyticity and boundedness of the four-point correlator and uh, in a thermal setup. And, and that talks about chaos? In the uh, that sets a bound on uh, on okay. how fast the, that correlator can grow. So uh, in the next couple of slides, I digress a bit uh, just to emphasize the importance of this bound. Uh, because I want to emphasize that possibly this bound has uh, more uh, applications in uh, kind of condensed matter systems uh, in the future. So that's why I wanted to uh, mention this point. Uh, in quantum many body systems uh, without a quasi particle description, these are usually the systems which are encountered in condensed matter physics. Uh, uh, it is well known that the dissipation time scale. Uh, it cannot grow, uh, it, is, it cannot be uh, shorter than this particular value. Uh, and this value is uh, seen, uh, this is the dissipation time scale 
of high tc superconductors so the statement is that uh, high tc superconductors have the shortest dissipation time scale and if you can just if you just contrast this against the statement that we just learned about lyapunov exponent uh, this seems to be uh, there seems to be a parallel there uh, which is what is being explored in more recent works by such devan collaborators so uh, basically the field theory at uh, and to make this uh, and the what they will exploit in making a, a more strong connection is that the field theory at the quantum critical point of high tc superconductors it shows features similar to a holographic cft so, so they coordinate this in uh, the superconducting phase and not in some strange metallic phase the left one uh, yes this is the non fermi liquid answer so in the strange metal phase uh this is a uh, strange metal yes yes so the, the statement is that the dissipation time scale is always greater than the maximum uh the way that you would one of them is going the opposite way to the other you draw in a kb to the which i will set to 1 yes So, the, the, the so this is a known is, answer in uh, in 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 the Sinai's matter literature. So the statement is that the dissipation yes. uh, time scale is greater than or equal to the Lyapunov ex the maximum Lyapunov exponent. Uh, yes, I guess these would be inversely related to each other. So then, no, no, they have to be the same. I mean, they they they're the same. They're both temperature, right. both temperature. Yes. They're constant times temperature. Yes. In both cases, H bar K B is one. Yes. In any in natural units, so yes. they must be. Ah. Uh, they can't be inversely related. Right. So the tau it's tau inverse, and lambda. Yes. So uh, so it's uh, one over tau. But the inverse tau is is the relevant quantity. Yes. It's greater than. Yes. Sorry, can I ask like like more simple questions? Because I'm really not used to understand matter uh, yes. at this point. Yes. Yes. Uh, like, what is the dissipation time scale? Like, what is being dissipated here? Uh, dissipation time scale is uh, uh, so I uh, from what I understand, it is how fast the information is scattered or dissipates or no longer remains. that would be how do you define information uh it, it would be some a uh, correlator that uh, it's the, an observable in the superconductor yes yes so it, there, there is a certain correlators which are measured there which are the jj correlators so two point functions or four point functions uh yeah in any case i wanted to just mention this as a like a, a point of interest that there could be potential uh applications of the bound Uh, in condensed matter literature, uh, but I mean, the, the, yeah. my problem is that they are contradicting one another. One says that the Lyapunov exponent, uh, that's the inverse Lyapunov exponent, is a time scale. It's yes. Tau tau l to the minus one is less than or equal to this, and the dissipation time inverse time is greater than or equal to this. Um, and I'm trying to don't understand what. Probably you're trying to connect the equality. No, no, no. They're both time scales. One of them is greater than or equal to the other one is less than. Lambda is lambda l to the minus one time. No, no. Probably you're trying to connect the temperature over here. The value is equal. Like the, the temperature is equal in both cases. So one of them. No, no. What I, I mean is like what this uh, what this tau inverse. Uh, Is equal to that? Is is it that? Is it defined by this um, like this critical point? Uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, yes, I, I don't recall. Yes, the critical the, point. The condensed matter right now, honestly. Uh, but uh, the, the like this kind of dissipation and uh, I don't know the other one. The, 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 there is this popular, mostly popular, right? By such a point. Not a good point. The uh, physics of strange materials have many similarities with uh, black holes. I would expect them to be really similar, not complementary. I'm puzzled also. Yeah. Uh, I think there is an inverse relationship between the two. Maybe I've not written the equation correctly. Maybe there's a typo there. There is. There may be. Uh, I'll check this out. No, no, no. It's it, it, 
Uh, so the, the 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 point that I want to make is that uh, the high DC super, the strange metal phase is uh, the fastest scrambler of information, and also black holes are fastest scramblers of information, and those two have many parallels. Uh, then, you, then you may need it, tau to the minus one to be less than or equal to this maximum. Uh, yes, I'll check this out uh, because I changed this equation a, a lot in the last couple of days <laughs> because I was also confused about it. Uh, and I took it from literature, so I'll check this out. Because tau to the yes. minus one divided by a k b is a layup of type exponent. Right. It has the same dimensions. It's the, mm -hmm. You could have written uh, since since lambda t at times t was your argument of your exponential. You right. could have written a time, the lambda l to the minus one is a time scale. Yeah, it must be a time because. Otherwise, it's the shortest inverse dissipation time scale instead of the shortest dissipation time scale. Yes, it must be, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So there must be a time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So, uh, moving on, uh, there are a few uh, theories where a violation of the Madison Schenker Stanford bound was also observed. So, uh, for example, in CFTs with a finite number of higher speed currents, uh, the Lyapunov exponent uh, is found to be this quantity uh, which violates the uh, MSS bound. Uh, in addition, uh, the Lyapunov exponent also gets modified in a CFT where a pair of heavy states are inserted at spatial infinity. Uh, so, this is the Lyapunov exponent in that case. And here also, if the heavy states have negative conformal dimension, and that is the theory violates unitarity, in that case also uh, some violations are observed. So, uh, just wanted to point out a few uh, cases where uh, theoretically at least it was seen that there are some violations. In the higher spin case, uh, which uh, assumption of the images goes wrong? Uh, so, yeah, so basically there also, uh, uh, in the higher spin case, uh, the assumption that goes uh, wrong is uh, of uh, unitarity itself because uh, when the higher spin charge is very large, then uh, the theory is not good in the sense we see it in uh, certain observables that in, like entanglement entropy, they don't come out to be as expected. Uh, whereas if we, uh, if the higher spin charge is taken to be small, so uh, as I've written in the second line, so uh, uh, when the higher spin charge has a certain bound so that uh, quantities like entanglement entropy, uh, they behave as expected and the theory is unitary, so then the bound is no longer violated. So it's unitarity uh, which uh, uh, which is uh, at play here in in both these examples. Okay, so uh, coming back to the main parts of the talk, uh, uh, so that was the introduction. Uh, so here uh, I will uh, we will compute the out of time ordered correlator in two D conformal field theory, and in the first part of the talk uh, we will compute it in a specific uh, uh, theory which is an ensemble with unequal left and right moving temperatures and in the second half of the talk uh, we will investigate a relationship between the out of time ordered correlator and the, the rate at which uh, an operator grows. So there is a, also a bound on the rate at which an operator can grow under evolution, time evolution and uh, there is a relationship between uh, OTOC growth and the operator growth, and we will investigate that in the second half of the talk. Uh, so let's uh, first focus on an ensemble with unequal left and right moving temperatures. Uh, so here is the partition function. Uh, so this particular CFT is dual to a rotating black hole in the bulk uh, with an angular momentum of rotation, which is omega, and the black hole temperature is, uh, inverse temperature is beta. Uh, so the CFT, it sees uh, the right and left moving modes, they see different temperatures uh, which are given here. So these are the inverse temperatures, beta left and beta right. Uh, the space-time coordinates on the CFT are sigma and t. Space is sigma and t is the time. And uh, the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic 
on the uh, on the on the plane uh, the holomorphic uh, is the coordinate is given by the exponential 2 pi by beta left times sigma minus t and the anti holomorphic coordinate is given by this formula here in what sense does it make sense to have the left movers at a different temperature to the right movers? So uh, they see a different temperature because of the rotation. Ah. Oh, it's, it's, it's... So basically, uh, I think it's obtained by uh, writing the usual formula for the partition function uh, with some chemical potential. And then uh, it was derived that one can write it more simply in this way. It, there is a factorization. Okay. Uh, between the left movers and right movers and they see different temperatures. So it's not like actually different temperatures. So Z and Z bars are not complex conjugates of each other anymore? Uh, they are not anymore. But if this were a Euclidean theory, so in that case, uh, this omega will be I omega, mm -hmm. some Euclidean, uh, I omega Euclidean, let's call it. Uh, so, if in the Euclidean sense, it would still be they would still be complex conjugates of each other, but not in the Lorentzian sense. No, but don't you need beta equals to beta for that? Uh, uh, the they would be complex conjugates. So, uh, I mean the Z, yeah. Uh -huh, the Z would be complex conjugates. Only if beta equals to beta no? after turning on the dial. No, uh, beta L would not be equal to beta R, but Z and Z bar would be complex conjugates. Uh, sorry, also. Uh, so there is a beta L here. Uh, uh, right. Oh, sorry, th these two will be complex conjugates to each other. And uh, these. Uh, I think they would also be, right? Because if you, uh, if you make this T's I tau. And uh, yeah, I think this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, should be a modular invariant function, and uh, which doesn't depend on z and z bar. So it's easier to discuss it at the level of z. And I'm confused as to what the uh, in what sense it's a modular invariant because you guys should have what you're putting into it. You beta the complex as well. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Betas will be complex in uh, uh, in the Euclidean case. So th there would be an i omega here, i in front of the omega. And then i in front of the t also. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so here we adopt the convention that uh, omega is greater than zero and less than or equal to one. So uh, essentially, now yes, that yes. So uh, the uh, standard this um, uh, this uh, periodic identification and getting to the to us that picture is still valid or uh, I didn't get your question. You draw this. A parallelograms and get to the torus from the complex plane. Yes. That picture is still valid or that somehow modified? Uh, so, are you talking about? Uh, I think it would be valid in the holomorphic plane and on the anti holomorphic plane individually, but with different temperatures. Okay. Yes. So, the so, so CFT is constructed by uh, S1 times S1. Uh, sorry, the torus is S1 times S1, it is independent of each other. So, uh, I, I think uh, at first I will focus on uh, the cylinder case. So, there would be, you can say, different cylinders for Z and Z bar, the holomorphic and anti holomorphic, so with different periods or uh, temperature. So, you mean tau and tau bar would be independent now, not complex on each other? Yes, so I, I'm talking uh, in the first part. I'll just focus on uh, the cylinder case, so only the thermal case, not the torus case. Okay. Uh, and there, the 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 uh, time circles mm -hmm. will have different periodicity in the uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinates. Sorry, I'll just take no more questions. Sorry. Yes.
Yes, moving on, uh, now that uh, we just saw that the conformal field theory uh, dual to rotating BTZ, uh, it sees uh, two different temperatures for the life, uh, left movers and right movers. Uh, so the naive expectation would be that there would be two Lyapunov exponents associated with this theory. Uh, and uh, these were indeed obtained in certain mm -hmm. whole... So are, there, are these temperatures related to the two horizons in the BTZ? Yes. They, they are? Yes, yes, they are. Okay. Yes. So, uh, this was indeed observed and there was an apparent violation of the chaos bound when uh, this particular temperature dominates. Uh, so, in this case, uh, in this particular case, uh, the Lyapunov exponent will be larger than 2 pi by beta. Uh, so, uh, basically what they observed is that the out of time ordered uh, using holographic computations is that the out of time ordered correlator for rotating BTZ exhibits a periodic modulation about an average decay. So here the average decay is uh, the orange dashed line is 2 pi by beta and about this decay there is oscillations uh, as shown by the blue line here. So uh, there are periods when the out of time order correlator is uh, dictated by one of the Lyapunov exponents and then the other one. Uh, so that causes the oscillations. Uh, I will explain this plot more in detail uh, later on in the talk. Just wanted to give an overview. So we will try to explain these from the CFT perspective and what happens to the out of time order correlated to the conformal field theory that leads to such oscillations to be there. So yeah, let's just first compute the out of time order correlator. Uh, and see how it is obtained from a Euclidean correlator. Uh, so here I gave a prescription. Uh, so let's first consider a Euclidean correlator uh, of uh, these operators, the W, a pair of W operators and a pair of V operators. Uh, and here, uh, since uh, we are interested in getting the correlator for uh, the particular CFT with uh, two temperatures, uh, with unequal left and right moving temperatures. So that's why I've written that here. Uh, now, the, uh, this, this procedure is independent of uh, which conformal field theory I'm talking about. It's not dependent on the specific CFT. Uh, so to get the out of time order correlator from this Euclidean correlator, uh, we assign small imaginary time to each operator. So each of these W's and V's will get a small imaginary time. And holding the imaginary times fixed, the real times are increased to the required Lorentzian value. Uh, so here the Lorentzian time is zero, here it is t, here it is zero again, here it is t. And these operators are also separated in space uh, by sigma. So the pair of V operators and the pair of, uh, the, the W operators are at zero uh, space and the V operators that are at sigma space location. And here uh, this gives the out of time ordered correlator for this particular ordering of the epsilons. Uh, and this is a normalized correlator. So this is uh, the usual uh, way how the out of time ordered correlators are obtained starting from Euclidean correlators. And where is the requirement that they have small imaginary times? Uh, yes. You, you can define this quite generally. This, this epsilon is small. Uh, but you can define it quite generally. And do you presumably have It's it's a uh, so essentially uh, basically epsilon. You have periodicity in imaginary time in this this case. Know, but I'm not sure what you have actually because you have two temperatures. So uh, right. So we are uh, we are taking them to be small because uh, they in a sense they uh, so as you can see here there are two W operators which are sitting at the same location zero mm -hmm. zero. Uh, but we need to separate them so that there is uh, so that is the cutoff epsilon that's coming in from there. And similarly for the two V operators, they're sit sitting at the same space-time location, sigma and t, and we need to separate them. Uh, 
Yes, so that's the UV cutoff. That's that. the, those epsilons are the UV cutoff that are coming in. Okay. Yes, yeah. I have another question just before that, which was with regard to your expectation values in general. Yes. If I write uh, some consider the UV. If when you've got these two temperatures, you were interested in taking expectation values with. Um, Yeah, at different times in in real time, but normally I expect to have periodicity in a imaginary time. This KMS condition. Yes. But it sounds like you have periodicity. You have two periodicities. Yes. And I'm, so that basically, just seems very strange, man. I think uh, the, the KMS way... conditions. Right. I would expect just one. Yeah. Uh. So oh, no, the way the calculation proceeds is that uh, we use uh, uh, the block expansion, and in that case, the blocks they factorize the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic parts, and so then we can talk about just the holomorphic block or just the anti-holomorphic blocks, each having different uh, so being associated with different periods, and that works out. But yeah, uh, I mean yes, in, in case of the uh, so, so basically, I would say that uh, uh, in terms of the entire correlator, what one is computing is there is uh, expectation value in an ensemble where there is a temperature and there is a chemical potential of rotation. Even still, I would expect periodicity in imaginary time to be with the beta, with temperature. Right. That's a very general KMS uh, result, yes. results, that KMS condition. Well, anyway, okay. It's, it's confusing. Yes, so uh, this is the prescription to get the out of time ordered correlator. And uh, so uh, essentially, uh, in the case of Euclidean correlators, the operator ordering does not matter. But uh, when we come to Lorentzian correlators, I already said that there is a time ordered correlator and out of time ordered correlator. That's because the time ordering matters. Uh, and there is multi-valuedness due to the branch cuts, which these branch cuts and depending on which branch you are at gives you the time ordered or the out of time ordered correlator in Lorentzian uh, terms. Another conformal block expansion which we will use to solve for this out of time ordered correlator, it introduces additional multi-valuedness and even in the Euclidean signature. Uh, so, if if uh, we were talking about the full Euclidean correlator, it would not be multi-valued. But as soon as you talk of it in terms of some block expansion, then the blocks could be uh, uh, multi-valued, but the entire sum of all the blocks will not be. Uh, so, if the correlator, so we will uh, approximate the correlator by a single Virasoro block, in which case uh, the result will depend on a chosen channel, and the prescription for choosing the channel is the following that we perform the Euclidean computation, continue to Lorentzian signature with the desired time ordering, and then select the channel which gives the maximal contribution. Uh, now, this prescription uh, has been used in uh, works uh, by authors, uh, by previous authors, and also not just in the uh, in the computation of out of time ordered correlators, but also for computing uh, entanglement entropy when there are heavy operators. Uh, so this prescription has been used earlier, and we will be using this prescription. So uh, to compute the OTOC, uh, we use the Virasoro block decomposition of the four-point function. Uh, so this is the uh, Virasoro block decomposition. These are the Virasoro blocks, uh, they, which depend on U and B, uh, which in turn depend on the conformal cross ratios eta and eta bar. Uh, these are the conformal cross ratios, and uh, I have written them explicitly for the particular configuration of the out of time model correlator that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, next, we will uh, just focus on the identity block here. So, this is a sum over all the Virasoro blocks, but we will only single out the identity block. So, that's in the identity block approximation. Uh, the out of time order, the normalized out of time order correlator is given uh, by the identity block, which factorizes 
uh, into the eta and the uh, bar block, uh, uh, the block which depends only on the uh, holomorphic cross ratio and the block which depends only on the anti holomorphic cross ratio. So, this was the factorization which I was talking about. Uh, so, uh, as an example, the identity block in the semi classical limit is uh, written here. Uh, what I mean by the semi classical limit is that uh, we are considering a large CCFT, CFT at a large central charge, uh, such that uh, this one of the operators, H, uh, the, the conformal dimension of one of the operators, uh, that is of the, of the W operator, uh, divided by C is held fixed and small, and uh, the conformal dimension of the V operator, it is much smaller than the central charge, but much larger than one. So that gives the semi-classical, uh, the block in the semi-classical limit. And as you can see here in this expression for the uh, block, uh, that there is a branch cut in the complex uh, eta plane. And that branch cut extends from 1 all the way to infinity. So you are considering a, a table with a large central charge. Yes. And this is the heavy, heavy light, light limit if... Uh, yeah. That makes uh, that sounds more familiar. Okay. Sure. Uh, so it's basically it's this particular branch cut which leads to the multivaluedness uh, in the Lorentzian correlator, uh, multivaluedness in the correlator, and. Uh, so how do we choose a channel? Uh, so uh, basically one could uh, go around this branch cut any number of times, maybe once or twice or many times. Uh, so basically if, if one goes around the branch cut k number of times where k is some integer, then uh, uh, one would make this substitution in the block and this is what you would get. So this is the uh, this is the uh, holomorphic block. This is the anti-holomorphic block. Contribution coming from the holomorphic block and the anti-holomorphic block. Uh, the uh, on the holomorphic block we are on the kth sheet, and in the anti-holomorphic uh, uh, block we are on the k bar sheet, where both of these are integers. So if this were a pure Euclidean calculation, then k bar would have to be equal to minus k, and then uh, uh, this correlator would be maximized. Uh, so this, uh, this, uh, these blocks, this multiplication of blocks would be maximized for k equals k bar equals zero. Uh, in the Lorentzian section, uh, since our prescription was to take the maximal contribution, the maximal contribution comes from only these two channels. One is when k equals one, k bar equals zero, and the other one is when k equals zero, k bar equals one. So that in the Lorentzian uh, uh, section, it corresponds to this particular uh, value for the normalized OTOC. So the normalized OTOC is either given by this or that. So these two. How, how do you see that the number that k bar uh, equals one and k bar equals zero uh, are the, uh, the choices in the Lorentzian? Uh, so basically, if uh, uh, if so in the Lorentzian case, this has to be true. So k bar is equal to minus k plus one. Uh, and if you impose this in here, that comes out. Okay, where does that condition come from? Uh, so basically, uh, in the Lorentzian case, to get the out of time ordering, yes. uh, there is an extra time that one of the uh, blocks cross, uh, in one of the blocks, the uh, cross ratio crosses the branch cut compared to the other one. So uh, to get the out of time ordering, uh, it's like one has to be on one side of the cut of the branch cut and the other. Yes, one. yes. So it's like it's it's related to crossing of the light cone. Uh, okay. And uh, so if we impose that in here, then only these two channels give the maximal contribution. Everything else will become much smaller. So if you put uh, like Sorry. two here or three here, that would be smaller than one. And how do you tell smallness here? Because these are complex numbers. Uh, right. I, uh, we 
Yes, we take the absolute value of the final answer. Okay, so it's yeah. the radius in the context. Yes. Yeah, yes. It's the smallest radius. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, it's these two channels which co uh, compete in which one, and one of them is maximum in different regimes. So we'll just focus on these two channels uh, uh, to get the uh, out of time ordered correlator. So one question. So uh, the Lorentzian correlator has uh, its market value. Yes. Is, it, is it due to the fact that you are taking only the identity contribution, or is it I mean, would it still be true if you had taken uh, all the contributions? So if you take all the contributions, uh, then also Lorentzian correlator would have uh, a branch cut because only then will we get this time ordered correlator and the out of time ordered correlator. So there will have to be a branch cut has to be crossed to get the out of time ordered correlator in the Lorentzian. Yes. So here is the result for the out of time ordered correlator. Uh, and uh, as I said, that both of these channels, they contribute in different, uh, they are maximal in different regions of space time. Uh, so that's the expression. And uh, this is the final expression in, uh, under certain approximations. So in the next slide, I have a good picture so that you don't have to look at these complicated equations. Uh, and uh, as we can see here is that at the late time, the decay of the out of time ordered correlator is given by the Lyapunov exponent, which is less than 2 pi by beta. So at late times, it is always in accordance with the uh, chaos bound. But at some intermediate time, it may have exhibit a Lyapunov growth, which is larger than 2 pi by beta. So basically, here is the picture. Uh, so what the previous equations say is the following. Uh, so this is the light cone. And only once you cross into the green region, do we get the out of time ordered correlator. In the blue regions, it's the ordered uh, time ordered correlator. And what this says is that if sigma uh, in the convention when omega is greater than zero, if sigma is positive, then if we go forward in time, uh, there would be a certain region where there will be faster growth of the OTOC. But at late times, it would always be the slower growth which will dominate. Uh, so the slower and faster growths are uh, are uh, demarcated by this uh, dashed line which keeps on extending and at late times it becomes almost parallel to the uh, t equals to sigma. And if in, uh, in these conventions one were to start at uh, uh, with operators at negative sigma and then uh, keep on increasing the time, then one would always encounter the slower uh, of the groups. Uh, so uh, that's the result and uh, there is agreement with uh, holographic computations, although this was not so well understood in the holographic computations. We have uh, got more insights by doing the CFT calculation and uh, also that uh, there is no violation at late times at least. Sorry, what is sigma again? What, what is sigma it? is the location of uh, one of the pairs of operators. So we're putting and the, other, and the other one is located at zero. zero yes, okay. zero space, zero time, and uh, one pair is located at zero space, zero time, and the other is at sigma and t. And the system is rotating. Yes. You've got this on me. Yes, so it has to do with the, so this negative and positive has to do with the sign of the omega that we're considering, so the direction of the rotation. Okay. And we're strictly restricting to positive omega, so then we can, otherwise, yeah, it's, it should be, then we can talk about. Can okay, I have a difficulty getting a physics picture of whether there should be a different sum of this? putting my operator to the left or to the right of... Because the, 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 the rotation is in a certain direction. Uh, so one of... Uh... I mean, don't really... 
Uh, we were talking about the Lorentz rotation. Yes. Lorentz. Are we talking about some? We're talking about some angular rotation in the space as we go up in time. Uh, it's the uh, angular it. rotating black hole is. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no black hole here in this picture. Ah, this, in this, is, picture this is yes. just your quantum yes. field theory size. So, so the, the quantum field theory, you put the one outside of one operator, to the operators at the origin, and another set to the left. You speak this circle or R? Uh, so, so here the space is the, not a circle, it's uh, dual to a black brain. Uh, so it's the space is uh, not compact. So a line. Line, yes. Then it can't be spatial rotation. It can't be spatial rotation, that's wrong. So I don't know what it is. Uh, I think it's spatial rotation, but uh, it's some limit of uh, it in the black brain geometry. That's for me. It's some, it's some limits of that we don't understand. Don't when you think of the uh, line as a limit, uh, as a li limit of a non compact circle? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. So yeah, yeah. The the discussion so far was in the decompactified limit, and now uh, I will look at the compact uh, the compact spatial circuit. So also to emphasize that, uh, so the results for the out of time ordered correlator which we derived, uh, they were in the heavy, heavy light, light limit. Uh, however, one could have also done the computation in the light, light limit, uh, which means that all the four operators, Ws and Bs, they would all be light. Uh, and in that case, uh, that gives that will also give the final result where there's an order one term and order one over C term. So just to mention the terms. So here, there, there are two terms in the final out of time order correlator. That's the order one term and the order one over C term. This is the result in the light light or when all the operators are taken to be light. Whereas this was the result when a, a pair of operators were heavier than the others. And so what I'm saying is that this could have been arrived at uh, by using the global conformal blocks. And by heavy and light you mean uh, that they are conformal weights. Yes. 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 Uh, so the latter result could have been arrived at uh, by using the global conformal block expansion and not the Virasoro expansion. And are you sure that there is a conformal field theory that satisfies the, all of these conditions? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I'm not. Uh, yeah. There is an angular moment. Uh, the potential for uh, rotation. Uh, that's easy I, enough, that's okay. Yeah. But you want to make sure that you have that you can you can do all of this with the operators. The, if I pick a C, I'm forced into a set of uh, highest weight operators for a given C. Yeah? Right. And um, I can find ones that and all of this analysis will go through with have you, have you worked out some example with this particular C? No. Well, what do you have in, what C do you have in mind? Uh, so we're just assuming large C. You're so you... Yes, all this is in the semi-classical limit, so uh, so large C computations. It's in semi-classical. Uh, uh, before moving on, how much time do I have so I'll plan accordingly? How much time do you need? <laughs> yes. Just like, uh, as far as my talk is concerned, I think I'm only halfway through, but I'm sure we cannot sit for another hour. So. Well, let's continue and see if I'm okay. Make it fast. Okay. So. Uh, 
Right. So as I was saying that uh, the out of time ordered correlator could also have been derived using the global conformal blocks, uh, the expansion of the four point function in global conformal blocks uh, in the limit where all the operators were light, the conformal dimensions of all the operators were light. And that's the global expansion in global conformal blocks. And as you can see that all we need uh, to get the result that I wrote earlier is the uh, uh, the the identity and the block with the stress tensor exchange, the global block of identity exchange and of stress tensor exchange. Uh, so the identity exchange gives the one and the uh, global, uh, the stress tensor global block gives the one over C term, which comes in the out of time ordered correlator. And this particular term, the stress tensor global block, uh, the contribution of the stress tensor global block is it corresponds to a graviton exchange in the bulk. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, certain. Uh, so uh, I will just uh, outline the strategy that is used to compute the out of time ordered correlator for CFT on a circle. So uh, why computed for a circle is that this will allow us to also go to the uh, uh, the limit of. Uh, uh, where the temperature is taken to infinity and at the extremal limit. And in that case, uh, one can see interesting interplay between the non-integrable and chaotic regimes. Uh, so uh, when we compactify the spatial direction of the CFT, the corresponding dual uh, in the bulk is a black hole. And uh, uh, so we are just interested in computing the order one term and order one over C term. And we saw that the stress tensor global block uh, gives the order one over C term. And uh, the stress tensor global block can also be written as a geodesic Witten diagram uh, with the graviton propagator connecting the geodesics between boundary insertion points. So this is uh, this was recently understood uh, by uh, these authors Krauss and Mika Guika Kuna in these works. And this is based on papers of Ferrara et al. in the 1970s, uh, which writes down the integral representation of global conformal blocks. Uh, so uh, we use, uh, that's one ingredient that we use. And uh, the other ingredient which we will use is that the graviton propagator uh, in, uh, in a BTZ black hole uh, can be written as a two point function, as a sum over two point functions in the black brain geometry. I think I changed that, but I don't know how I did. So the graviton propagator in BTZ black hole can be written as a sum over two point functions in BTZ black brain geometry. So that's due to uh, the work of Keski Wakuri in 1998. So these are the ingredients we will use. So uh, the, the intuition comes from the bulk uh, by the geodesic written diagrams. Uh, so the operators, uh, so here this is the, uh, so the filled cylinder is the bulk black brain geometry and the CFT is living on the uh, boundary of the cylinder, on the uh, curved surface of the cylinder and the operators V and W are inserted very close to each other uh, and uh, there is a geodesic which is connecting the, the red geodesics connecting the VV operators and the WW operators and the green curve is the graviton propagator uh, which connects these two and uh, so this is the geodesic Witten diagram in the bulk and the integration is only over the geodesic so the point that is connecting the red and the green so that point there that point is being integrated along all this geodesic and similarly here so that is the geodesic Witten diagram. Uh, now, in compactifying this uh, and getting the answer, uh, we make three assumptions. Uh, first is that uh, all the operators are light, as I said. The second thing is uh, that we consider the time, uh, the time circle to be, uh, the spatial circle to be much larger than beta. So the periodicity in the spatial direction is much, much larger uh, than beta. and uh, the third assumption is that both these V operators are inserted very close to each other and both these W operators are inserted very close to each other. So uh, what this does is that now if we were to consider compactifying this 
uh, uh, considering both these V operators very close to each other and the W operators very close to each other ensures that uh, these red geodesics at least they do not know about the compactification into a large torus. And the only way that uh, the effect of the compactification it comes is that this graviton propagator can go around uh, this uh, around this torus many number of times. And we need to take into account all these contributions. So using this, uh, what we get is that under these approximations, the approximations are listed here, uh, we can write the OTOC in the compact case as uh, 1 plus sum over uh, the stress tensor global blocks uh, on a black brain geometry and now the sum is basically uh, over the fact that the spatial coordinate in the argument is being shifted uh, by 2 pi n in each of the blocks. So that takes into account the fact that uh, the, there are many contributions due to the graviton going around the spatial part of the torus one times or two times or so on. So that takes that into account. And basically putting all that together, so we apply this, for, we use this formula to arrive at uh, the out of time ordered correlator in the compact case. And uh, so uh, it's not a very, uh, uh, I think uh, it's not too uh, surprising that this agrees with the holographic results because we use so much of holographic intuition, but ultimately we use this, uh, under these approximations, this formula uh, on the CFT side and we find this result for the out of time ordered correlator. Uh, yeah, so this again can be uh, depicted by uh, the, this result can be depicted by the plot here. So basically, uh, on an average, the out of time ordered correlator decays by 2 pi by beta, but there are oscillations about this average decay that's coming from uh, uh, basically the fact that the graviton is going around and that's captured here by this n star mod 1 term where the n star contains time dependence in there. So that kind of explains the result that I uh, showed in the beginning. And so about the CFT, you are only uh, using uh, the fact that it has a holographic tool. Uh, what is the about the CFT? Uh, so essentially, what we are saying is that uh, we are what we are using is that relationship between global conformal blocks and the Witten diagram. Uh, and the relationship that the global conformal block can be written as a geodesic Witten diagram. Uh, we are using that intuition. To write uh, to say that uh, uh, to say that this particular formula here on the first line will give the correct uh, uh, at least in this approximation it will give give the answer. Yeah, yeah. I think just to get to the Witten diagram story, you have to assume the existence of a holographic dual. So you are assuming that. Uh, yes, to get to the Witten diagram, you use the fact that uh, the global conformal block can be written as an, in, there is an integral representation for it in terms of uh, hypergeometric functions. So there's some integral over some hypergeometric functions. Even if the CFT does not have a holographic dual, Yes, yes, that's true, independent of. So just the fact that there is an integral representation of the global conformal block that is independent of having a holographic dual. And then that structure and the, the structure of the geodesic Witten diagram, they are very similar and then by drawing parallels uh, between the two, it was shown that they are the same up to some factors. And you need large C? Yes, large C. Yes. But no assumption is made about the linguistic term. Or you know, go blah, blah, blah. Uh, the paper of Ferrara at all, uh, I'm not sure if they made any more assumptions. Uh, um, I don't recollect uh, exactly if they made more assumptions.
Right. So also, uh, so in the extremal limit, uh, basically, uh, inst okay, instead of showing you this, let me just show you the plot here. So in the extremal limit, uh, the OTOC, uh, what the extremal limit means that uh, uh, we're taking beta to infinity, the temp uh, inverse temperature to infinity, uh, omega to one. And in this limit, uh, the left movers see an infinite, temp uh, uh, this, uh, sorry, the right movers see uh, zero temperature and infinite inverse temperature and the left mover still see a finite temperature. So on the one hand, uh, 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 one half of the theory sees uh, zero temperature. So in zero temperature, what happens is uh, usually we ex don't expect exponential growth. There's some polynomial growth in time of the out of time wanted correlator. It's only for uh, a theory at finite temperature that there is exponential growth. So there is an interesting interplay between the two in this regime. And basically what we find here is that there is a polynomial growth, but on that polynomial growth is superimposed an oscillatory pattern again, where there are periods of exponential growth. So that's depicted here. So that's the uh, uh, that's the average cubic growth, the orange dashed line. And here, uh, the blue curve are the, uh, the OTOC, the actual OTOC. So here there are periods of local quadratic growth that come, that are dominated by the zero temperature regime. And then there are periods of this exponential growth, which come because of the regime where there is a, a finite temperature. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, so there is a lot of uh, discussion in the literature of this uh, interplay between integrable and chaotic and the transition between the two. So we found this to be an interesting setup where uh, there is a inter uh, there is a non-trivial interplay between the two regions. Okay, so the uh, exponential growth looks like they're getting longer as we go up and up. Uh, Both periods, so the teeth are getting more separated. Uh, yes. Right. Sorry. Also, were you able to fit the uh, infinity to an exponential? I know you didn't put the exponentials in there. Uh, I, I, I think the exponential, uh, so the quadratic, the uh, quadratic is getting longer, isn't it? Yeah. The exponential is just going up. It also looks like it's taking there, but they want to turn it down there. But is it, is it actually exponential? Can you tell the uh, exponents from it? Yes, yes, there is an exponential. So it's fit with this Yes, yes. So there is the exponent. This is the exponential. Yes. So you know, basically in the plot, you are plotting this scale with the with the coordinate time. Uh, so maybe uh, because of the time, uh, I can just tell you very briefly about the second half, just the introduction, and not go into the details. So we can uh, we can see the, the exponential here is two pi. It's like it's probably two pi squared over beta. This one. Two pi squared over beta. The exponent, the time dependence of the exponential. Yes. Yes. The yes. Ones, when we are calculating answers, it's two pi over beta. Yeah. And there's also mod 2 here, so this entire yeah, yeah, is mod 2 by 2. Yeah, okay. It's So yeah, I'll just briefly tell you about the relationship between out of time ordered correlator and uh, the bound on operator growth. Uh, maybe I'll be brief in this section and try not to go over every all the slides. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, if you look uh, at Heisenberg evolution of an operator, uh, it can be if, if using the Baker-Campbell-Hostow formula it can be written in this way. 
uh, and in this picture what is represented is that the operator is at time zero is represented by the black dot and then uh, if you act on it with the commutator it will give more number of terms represented by these yellow dots here if you act on it with uh, two commutators with the edge it will give even more terms shown by the blue dots here and so on the terms will keep on increasing so in a sense the under evolution the operator is growing and the growth is exponential uh, uh, so uh, the operator growth is exponential what did you plot it here uh, it's not plotted i'm just uh, kind of indicating that uh, if we act uh, say uh, so i'm not taking any specific hamiltonian but say if you take the ising hamiltonian i mean what you written is the joint action of the of the hamiltonian on the uh, it's e to the adjoining e to the h add as uh, as you were telling us earlier yes. acting on O. e to the i h add acting on O. and would you want to expand out h add for exponential beta h add yes somewhere yes yes so the baker campbell hostel formula is used what, what, what why is that uh, helpful it looks very deceptive to me The actual terms are some linear combinations of those two dots and three dots and so on. Well, that's just going to be some expansion of, of the joint action. I mean, you could write e to the i times any operator as, as, as a linear term or quadratic term. Yes, yes, yes. So this is e to the i, e to the i, h commutator, t, with the joint action of you know, t. It's a different representation of the Hamiltonian. It's the Hamiltonian, the joint action of the Hamiltonian. And it's just the unitary evolution with the joint action that you've expanded out and for some reason. But so you're only interested in small time, is that what it is? Uh, yes. Okay. But you're... I can't see how I can be, I'll be sure that there's a exponential growth the operator growth goes like lambda g times t. It looks like yes, this growth. Do you mean the support of the operator? Uh, so, by growth, what I mean is that, uh, uh, so for example, if I were to use for the Hamiltonian, the Ising Hamiltonian, so. And uh, uh, right, there would be maybe there is another term here which is given by the z. So you are trying to say that this has support for many lattice sites. Yes, yes. And then if I were to uh, take this commutator with any uh, particular, uh, say, uh, operator, let's just say y. Then that would give me several terms. If I were to take one more commutator, that will give me even more terms, and that will be those number of terms uh, uh, with more nested commutators that will keep on increasing. So that is what I uh, mean. Uh, I mean, this has been uh, explicitly computed for certain models, and uh, for those particular models, it has been found that uh, uh, there is growth, there is exponential growth. Uh, and uh, so, uh, in in this literature, they use a certain quantity uh, of whose ex operator, uh, uh, which with which they quantify operator growth. It's called the Krilov complexity. Uh, but I, I I wanted to avoid going too much into the details. That's why I did not write Krilov complexity. <laughs> there on the slide, right? So, uh, so in these papers of Parker and other authors, uh, the uh, the conjecture is that the out of time order correlator cannot grow any faster uh, than this operator growth. So, the rate at which the operator grows, 
so the Lyapunov exponent has to be less than or equal to uh, this exponential growth of the operator. Uh, and there has been interest in understanding this bound in the context of conformal field theories. And uh, uh, basically, we do understand this bound. Uh, so we considered a certain a particular setup for which this operator growth, so that lambda g was known already, that is to be 2 pi, it was known for evolution under this particular Hamiltonian. And uh, uh, so this Hamiltonian is composed of Virasoro generators. Uh, this kind of Hamiltonians, they are encountered in the study of eight homogeneous quenches and we chose this because uh, in certain papers, this already is known how fast the operator grows under the evolution by these Hamiltonians. Uh, and we check this conjecture and uh, we do find that uh, uh, the out of time ordered correlator that we derive, it is uh, not just bounded by, but it saturates this particular uh, uh, th this particular value, so this bound on op uh, on the growth of OTOC set by uh, the operator growth. In view of time constraints, I think I'll just give that result and not go into details. <laughs> Thank you very much for your support. There are questions about that more. We've been asking questions as we go along, as you know, just try. Is there a definition of lambda g? Yes, so it, it comes from Krilov complexity. Uh, so there, uh, there's a definition or there's a concrete definition of Krilov complexity. Uh, definition itself is complex? Uh, there is a little bit complexity there, that's why uh, I don't want to lead with that because the reason is that uh, there is a certain, uh, one of the quantities there is not fixed, so it, it is basis dependent, uh, so that's the complexity <laughs> in Krilov complexity, but usually people consider one particular kind of basis, so in all the literature one kind of basis is only considered uh, and uh, in, in that basis uh, Krilov complexity is computed for different theories, and uh, this is bound like has you been. You have your qubits and gates, and then you see that how many times you have to operate those gates to uh, uh, simulate uh, that operator time infusion. Is it still on that line? Uh, no, it's not around that line. It is uh, basically around this line of uh, growth of operator using the nested commutators. Uh, and uh, so there is a basis, right? So there is a basis of uh, operators which are written. Uh, so the support of this operator increases, it's uh, probably related to that size of the support. Yes, yeah. So it's not to do with that kind of complexity, as you said. Uh, it's more related to. Uh, a basis that is defined in this kind of space. Uh, so I think the basis is the following. The basis is, uh, uh, so each of these define a basis vector. So this one is maybe psi 2, then there is a psi 1, which is, is this one and so on. But then this is just one vector. Uh, no, all the, the entire tower. Uh, so the basis is composed of uh, some linear com uh, of these vectors, the entire tower. So there will be more, right? Yeah, but I think in that picture, I thought you want to confirm that in each state the support increases. Uh, psi 2 in some sense is bigger than psi 1. Yes. I thought it's, it's composed of more number of Terms. Yeah, it's a support on more sides. Yes, yes. And uh, the basis is a linear combination of those vectors as far as I'm sure. uh, Yeah. These are not orthogonal, this but the basis is. Uh, it's probably over complete.
I mean, I don't, it's, it's hard to tell. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.